the rationality principle, the collective action principle, the five principles of politics really as a whole, lead us to an inescapable conclusion. Politics have self-interest at their very core. Political decisions are made with some degree of self-interest in mind, whether we're dealing with the corrupt notion of self-interest where leaders choose policies that will personally benefit that they will personally benefit from, or more nobly a uh, self-interest where our leaders wanting to be reelected behave in accordance with that goal. Either way, politics is a selfish game, so who it is that controls policies is a very important question. For the question of who it is that really runs the show, we turn to the textbook that we've used in the past in this class, James Wilson's American Government. The five principles of politics are a great framework for determining why policies end up looking the way they do, but what Wilson chooses to look at, though, is who it is that shapes policies, which, as we've just determined, plays a big role in what policies end up looking like. So these are the four views of who governs, according to James Q. Wilson, and theory the first is the Marxist theory, that economic elites have disproportionate control over the government. Now, when we hear Marxist theory and we immediately start to heap in everything we know about communism, but this is really more Marxist historical and social theory than it is communism. One could be a staunch capitalist and still believe that there is a Marxist view of power distribution or a Marxist view of who it is that governs. It's simply the belief that money, in particular big money, matters in producing political outcomes. Example number one, you see Howard Schultz here, uh, the CEO of Starbucks. Schultz is a outspoken political mover and shaker, but the one thing that he did a few years ago that best speaks to the Marxist view is that he banded together with a coalition of other CEOs and made a pact that they were not going to give campaign donations to members of either of the two major parties until a long-term solution to the national debt was reached. The implicit, or perhaps even explicit, message here was that Schultz believes that wealthy people can control public policy through their use of campaign donations. And they darn well better be able to, otherwise Sheldon Adelson, seen here, wasted a whole bunch of money on the 2012 election cycle. The casino mag magnet estimated, donated an estimated $50 million to Republican campaigns in 2012, a topic that we'll get to and, and we'll revisit this when we get to Chapter 11 and the nation's campaign finance laws, or lack thereof, but clearly these donations were made with the assumption that, number one, they would influence the election, and, number two, the candidates would, when in office, pursue policies that would be beneficial to Sheldon Addison. That said, things did not go particularly well for Mr. Adelson, as we can see here, most of his money went to backing losers. So that's the Marxist view of power distribution, the idea that money controls American politics. We see some evidence for it on a regular basis, but certainly it's not the end-all and be-all of determining political outcomes, and we're actually going to take a look at that in our Analyzing the Evidence activity coming up next week. But since it's not the silver bullet, let's go ahead and take a look at some other views. View number two. The next theory is that it's not directly wealth that gives one disproportionate control over the political processes, but rather a certain degree of social and public influence. While this is the theory, uh, this is the theory of the power elite posed by C. Wright Mill, and it might seem kind of self-evident to us. People who exert more control over government exert more control over government. Obvious claim is obvious. It's kind of a tautology. It takes a few examples to really understand the point that Mill is making here. Take, for example, former South Carolina Senator Jim DeMint, seen here. A longtime powerful senator, Jim DeMint voluntarily left the Senate to be a head of the conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation. By leaving a position of power, DeMint knew that his reputation and his influence as a lobbyist would actually allow him to exercise a greater degree of control over politics by shaping the conservative movement. 
he can do more by influencing what a party believes than he can as one member of that party. So clearly Jim DeMint subscribes to a certain level of the power elite view, the idea that he, as a social elite, will have a disproportionate amount of control over government and political processes. We're fundamentally familiar with how power elites work, though. One individual, say, is so powerful and so respected and valued within a certain section of society that it can have profound impacts on others. Other people will defer to someone else that they believe to be a cultural leader. See, Oprah buys a book or a latte and markets bend to her very whim. Well, think about that in the political arena. To conservatives, Jim DeMint's views will be critical to shaping their own. To libertarians, Ron Paul is a power elite. Uh, for a long time, the voice to many, that many Americans deferred to on military policy was this man's, Dave Petraeus. And the recent downfall of General Petraeus following his resignation after the revelation of his extramarital affair points out really what the crux of the power elite view is. Jim DeMint's power, the South Carolina Senator Jim DeMint's power, didn't stem from his position, nor did Dave Petraeus's, and nor does Oprah's. Their influence stems from the fact that people, large groups of people in fact, put stock in what they have to say. Petraeus was a power elite not because of his multiple military roles, although those were certainly very high-ranking and respectable positions. Most people can't tell you who fills a lot of those roles now. It was because he was interviewed on TV and in Rolling Stone and trusted as a guiding voice on military policy. That there are elites who have disproportionate sway because of the way society views them is really the crux of Mills's power elite theory. We need to be careful when using this four views model not to just cop out and always label something as a power elite view because this is somebody who exerts sway over the government. The four views model is built around the assumption that some figures have disproportionate sway, the power elite view only applies when that sway exists because society has invested a great deal of trust in that figure, or at least some portion of society has. Effectively conferring authority over their own political preferences to this figure, to apply the term from the previous video. Let's leave this one for one that's much less sexy and glamorous, the bureaucratic view. Almost the polar opposite of the two. Who is it that controls policy outcomes? Well, according to Max Weber seen here, it's no one that you know. Policy is effectively determined, according to the bureaucratic view, by the base level workers and bureaucrats who put policies into place. Whether or not you get your passport renewed in time to go on that vacation you want to go on, that isn't up to the Secretary of State, it's up to the drone working that passport office and how much they feel like pressing the issue over the next three weeks. Whether or not your pocket knife makes it onto that airplane is up to the judgment of that TSA agent. Policies are what they are, but reality is crafted by a DMV worker. Probably the best anecdote that I would have to go with the bureaucratic view is a recent case out of Massachusetts. A forensic chemist there pled guilty to charges that she had been falsifying lab results for criminal cases, just making up results based on whatever prosecutor or attorney, or attorney she needed favors from or had been paid off by. And because she did this, she had tainted some 1,100 cases. Just as in history there's been the illusion of the great man version of history, the belief that single leaders brought about a major series of events when that's very rarely actually the case, well, just as we need to watch out for that fallacy in history, so too is there the risk of falling into the trap of great man government. Sure, the policies made at the top really matter, but they're bunk if they're going to be if there's gonna be some bureaucrat who's going to go rogue and undermine them. So that's the bureaucratic view, the idea that government workers have the real control over the government. But we end up with our fourth and kind of final, although nothing's really final here, view. The pluralist view. And this last view is the one that most closely defines the dominant view of American politics. The first three all have just a little bit of that tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist to them, believing that it's all controlled by a small group. And the fourth view is that political outcomes really are the result of competitions between groups. 
this certainly matches the uh, Lowy five principles of power or five principles of politics framework that collective action is what ends up shaping politics. But look at two power elite figures here who are on opposite sides of an issue. Gabby Giffords, the former Arizona congresswoman who survived an assassination attempt, and Wayne LaPierre, the president of the NRA. The pluralist view tells us that our nation's gun policy is going to be the result of the competition between the coalitions that these two individuals represent. The gun lobby will do their part to sway voters and lawmakers, the anti-gun lobby will do their part, and the result will be our society's verdict of who won. To a certain extent, this is exactly what James Madison tells us should happen in the United States in Federalist Number 10. To a certain extent, this is what the 13 American arguments that you read all summer are all about, but we must be wary of oversimplifying this lest we fall into the trap of assuming that political outcomes should be about winners and losers, and winners get their way and losers get to go home and cry about their best. For a fair, functioning government to exist, the rights of the minority need to be protected as well, so there must be some form of compromise. That said, the pluralist view, the idea that policies are the result of competition between affected interests, those are the four, that is the fourth of our four views of who governs, according to James Q. Wilson. It's either money that rules in the Marxist view, influence over society in the power elite view, the faceless bureaucrats, perhaps, in Max Weber's bureaucratic view, or the constant competition between interests. Before we wrap this up, though, there's one last reality that we need to be gently reminded of. And that's this. Alexei de Tocqueville writes in, Amer in Democracy in America, probably the seminal text on understanding American society, Quote, Americans are fond of explaining almost all the actions of their lives by the principle of self-interest rightly understood. In this respect, I think they frequently fail to do themselves justice. For in the United States, as well as elsewhere, people are sometimes seen to give, a, give way to those disinterested and spontaneous impulses that are natural to man. Whenever we introduce politics, we do so, in America at least, by introducing the idea that it's this competition between interests. The rationality principle tells us that all political behavior is towards a rational end. Aristotle defined democracy as being people acting in their own self-interest, and the pluralist view tells us that we compete for the policies that we want. And this can go a long way to explaining our system, but I think we need to heed the words of Alexei de Tocqueville, who really, from his writings, seems to understand American democracy possibly better than anyone else. Maybe we sell ourselves short. Maybe American politics isn't always a competition between interests. Consider Walter Francis White. No, not Walter White, Walter Francis White, the man who built the NAACP into the organization it was during the Civil Rights Movement. White did more to advance civil rights and fight for segregation in this country than just about anyone else in his time period, when clearly, if you take a physical look at him, he himself was not personally a victim of segregation, except in the sense that all good people are harmed by injustice. Consider the firefighters and first responders for September 11th, and other emergencies and tragedies. If we try to view politics, if we try to view human behavior as a response to personal interests and incentives, we will always be left without an explanation for some of the most important behaviors and actions that we see. A government course will require you to understand political behavior, and hopefully in the reading on Chapter 1 has helped with that and will continue to help with that. An AP course will demand that we understand that through a variety of different frameworks, and hopefully this video has helped us along that road, although we'll work to clarifying and reinforcing some of that in class. But life requires us to understand that understanding political motivations only describes a portion of political behavior because any human behavior is really subject to our sense of humanity. That's it for today. We'll keep on with the videos next week. We'll do our summer reading tomorrow. Don't forget to Spartan up.